Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Central Asia Metals 2023 full year results presentation. Just scrolling down through the slides, uh, standard disclaimer, people like to take a look at that. Uh, and just looking into now the company overview. So if we move to slide four, please, I think most people know where we operate. But just to reiterate the fact, we have two solid operations in Kunrad. We operate the in-situ dump leach and SXEW processing facility, uh, which has now been in production for almost 12 years and has a life of mine out to 2034. And in North Macedonia, uh, we own the underground zinc and lead mine just in the northeast of Macedonia there. Production commenced way back in the 1960s. We acquired it in late 2017, and that now has a life of mine out to 2039. Both operations are 100% owned by Camel. Next slide, please. And now to the core of this presentation this morning. Um, 2023 was a challenging year with depressed metal prices for us and also remaining inflation in the marketplace. But we put in a solid financial performance and you can see some of the highlights there. Generating revenue of $207.4 million with an EBITDA of $96.5 million, which is an EBITDA margin of 47%. In turn, that generated free cash flow for the business of $57.5 million. And we also invested quite heavily into our business, both at Sasa and in Kunrad, developing the projects for the future. And a total investment there of $27.8 million. We remain debt-free, having paid the debt off in August 2022 of the Sasa acquisition. We have cash in the bank, $57.2 million. And I'm delighted this morning to announce a full-year dividend of 18 pence. That's a final of nine pence to add on to the nine pence interim dividend we paid last October. That is a total in the year of 20, if, sorry, for 2023 of $40 million and above policy dividend. And you can see the table there of the strong returns to shareholders over the years. Now having paid back $339 million to shareholders, a £1.70 since we started paying dividends back in 2012. So a solid financial performance. Turning to slide number six. We've also had a busy year on site at both operations, not only on production, achieving our guidance production to the upper end in Kunrad, 13,816 tonnes of copper, and in the middle of the fairway in 2023 for zinc and lead, 20,338 tonnes of zinc and 27,794 tonnes of uh, lead production. So delivering that production alongside of some heavy capital investment as we made significant strides towards completing our transition to cut and fill mining at the Sasser operation and also invested and completed our solar power project uh, at Coonrad. You can see the details there and we'll talk more about those later. Just on to the seven, the slide number seven, sorry. Uh, and just to reiterate, and I probably already have done our investment case here. Uh, I think five key things to point out here in investing in Camel. One is very dependable and profitable operations. Uh, even in difficult markets, our business model of a low cost operation meant that we could return very strong profitable margins and a 47% EBITDA margin, as I've already mentioned. Also, reliable and solid dividends and return and management of our capital allocation, both investing in the projects, as well as a strong dividend policy and return to shareholders in line with our policy there of 30 to 50 percent, but above policy, policy for this particular year. And then also we've got a record of delivery, good track record of producing the metals that we, we produce across the patch and meeting our guidance uh, annually. And the last but by no means least, our ESG credentials, both in terms of a strong governance business, strong health and safety. We had a, a very good year last year. We just did LTIFR, that's lost time incidence frequency rate of 0.4, beating our target for the year. But also the advances we've made in our sustainability reporting and our greenhouse gas emissions reduction. So a strong business case to invest in Camel. And then if we turn to the last slide before I hand over to Gavin. <coughs> For more details on the finances, all I really want to point out on this particular slide is what our objectives are. In the short term, to focus on those operations, maintain them as low cost and high margin, ensure that the money we generate from those operations is prudently allocated both back into the business as well as providing good returns for our shareholders. Focusing on sustainability angle of the business, and we've got those five pillars we talk about. And last but by no means least, a long-term strategic objective 
to deliver growth to the shareholders, both through early stage exploration, of which Louise will talk about more later in the presentation, but also looking for a transformational uh, acquisition to actually grow the business, which we are still actively looking for. And on that note, I'll hand over now to Gavin to talk more about the finances in details. Thank you. We kick off looking at just the commodity markets and the other uh, macroeconomic conditions that affected our business. Um, don't dwell on the slide for too long, but uh, really in the terms of the commodity markets, it's the zinc price that affected these results. You can see the zinc price change over the year um, of 24% down, uh, which is a, a, had a big impact on us. Um, otherwise, the, the other commodity prices remained relatively stable. The other thing in the zinc markets that did affect us as a result of the energy crisis that we saw earlier in the year was that uh, European smelting capacity was reduced and that increased uh, treatment charges that come off the revenue line as well. Go to the right hand side of the slide. Um, whilst inflation is trending downwards, we did um, feel the impact of uh, inflation in both of our operating jurisdictions, 9.8% in Kazakhstan and 9.4% in North Macedonia. Um, and that led us to sort of giving our staff competitive pay rises uh, in response to the increased cost of living in both of those jurisdictions. Um, that is offset slightly by a fall in electricity prices. We did see a 40% decrease from uh, the price that we achieved last year down to 11 cents a kilowatt hour, which is still slightly above what we've achieved historically, but uh, trending in the right direction. Uh, in terms of taxes, um, we announced, I think, at the interims uh, in September that 10% uh, withholding tax had been introduced on intercompany dividends from Kazakhstan. That's had a $7 million impact on us. And um, MET rates, which is the royalty that we pay to the government, increased by 50% to 8.55%. Um, and you can see around a $3 million impact on, on that front. And then there's an accounting uh, standard that was introduced uh, and acted retrospectively to the end, uh, beginning of 2022. This is non-cash, but it does add another million dollars to our income tax line. And uh, I'll go to that in a minute. Foreign exchange, um, whilst the movements uh, were fairly, uh, fairly modest at 3% and 2%, the US dollar against our operating currencies, um, they did go in the wrong direction for us. And we'll talk about the impact on our income statement on the next slide, please. Um, as Nigel said, this uh, Income statement uh, reflects a, a really good overall performance given the, uh, the macro environment and that 47% uh, EBITDA margin. And um, if we just step through the uh, highlights um, on the, on the right-hand side of the table on the right-hand side, we can see the gross revenue uh, period on period is down 11%. That's a function of metal prices, primarily that zinc price coming off 24%. Uh, we've seen the increase in uh, treatment charges. That's about one and a half million dollars uh, off, off of that revenue line. That's where those are embedded. And then we've seen volumes down slightly, uh, particularly at, uh, at Kunrad, um, year on year, around 438 tons of copper less produced there. If we turn to our cost of sales now, if we recall those uh, uh, inflation rates that I mentioned earlier, approaching 10%, a 6% cost increase overall um, doesn't seem too bad. And when you dig into that even deeper, um, that MET that I mentioned earlier, that, that royalty to the government of $3 million, that's in that line as well. But we have seen proper cost inflation coming through on payroll, which I mentioned earlier, plus also reagents, spare parts, and there's a small foreign exchange element embedded in cost of sales as well of a couple of million dollars. Um, next line, the foreign exchange loss. This is non-cash. Okay, it looks like a huge swing. Um, of $10.2 million, but uh, just to reiterate, it's non-cash, and that relates to the current translation in relation to those currency movements I mentioned earlier on our intercompany loans, which are booked in US dollars, where we see them here, but at local level, they're booked in Tenge and in Macedonian denars. Um, admin expenses, now those include a few exciting things, actually. Um, we've got, uh, whilst they do look like, like they've gone up, those are uh, business development costs, and uh, Louise will talk about those in more detail um, later. Uh, they include our contributions to the foundations. Uh, there's the uh, foundations at Kunrad and at Sasa, where we're contributing 0.5% uh, of our revenue. Also cost in establishing another exploration play in, Ka in Kazakhstan. And then we've also seen some payroll coming through there, uh, not only at group level, but also adding um, senior technical staff uh, to run the projects, which Nigel will walk you through in a minute as well. Um, finance costs, um, again, these are primarily non-cash. These, uh, these are the um, amortization of what we call our asset retirement obligations go through there. So $1.7 million of that finance cost is related to that. The rest are related to leases around offices and other bits of, bits of kit. 
finance income um, with interest rates where they are. We have benefited slightly from that with uh, $1.9 million of interest received. And then the taxation line, as I said earlier, 7.7 .7 million additional withholding tax in that line, plus also the non-cash IAX, uh, sorry, IAS adjustment of a million dollars related to the new standard. That all comes down to um, yeah, profit after tax of uh, $37.4 million and EBITDA of $96.5 million. And um, that EPS line, um, you know, again, includes a couple of those non-cash uh, non items there. So, you know, in, in reality, we've probably performed a little bit better than what the accountants will have us believe here. <laughs> um, let's move on to the next slide. Um, this is just to break down the, uh, the EBITDA um, year on year. Um, I think I've been through all of these in, in huge detail. So just to point out the, uh, the impact of the commodity prices on the left-hand side, particularly the zinc price. <clears throat> and then, um, you know, treatment charges, as I said earlier, up a million and a half dollars. Royalties um, uh, up again. The contributions to the foundation, $600,000. And then those business development costs of $1.2 million, all contributing to that uh, EBITDA um, from uh, from 131.6 in the previous period to 96.5, but the biggest impact obviously is commodity prices. <laughs> Moving on to each of the uh, each of the assets, um, Kunran's revenue performance was pretty good. If you remember, the uh, the copper price was uh, was fairly stable through the year, just that sort of slight reduction in volumes. Um, what we have seen on the cost base uh, is that uh, payroll increase coming through that I mentioned earlier. That is. Uh, around a million dollars, uh, higher reagent costs. We've seen things like asset prices and escape prices, which are two of our key ingredients, go up by 30% plus each, um, partly in response to uh, the global economic pressures. Uh, SK is an oil-based uh, product. Sulfuric acid, um, you know, that's gone up, but uh, the, our supply is absolutely robust. Uh, we, we purchase everything internally in Kazakhstan there. So that's all um, all under control. And um, we've also had uh, a three cent impact on that just through that lower production that we've seen as well. Um, we're still one of the lowest cost copper produce, pure copper producers in the world with that EBITDA bar margin of 71 cents. So still a, a really good performance by Kronrak. Moving on to Sasa, uh, run of mine costs, we sort of rather than uh, confuse things with all of the translations from zinc to lead and vice versa, uh, we're just going to present our run of mine costs here. Um, we can see that they have gone up uh, slightly year on year. Now, $3 a ton of that increase includes the payroll cost. Again, same thing in Macedonia. We've seen some inflation coming through there, plus some additional headcount as we construct these two capital projects. Or sorry, the capital projects, but there's some three elements to it, really. Sorry. Um, and then we're upgrading our whole maintenance uh, to improve fleet uh, uh, performance, uh, so on and so forth. So that that's translated into $1.3 per ton increase. And um, drilling and training, uh, clearly training is going to be key with the implementation of the capital project. So we are investing in that. But the benefit of those lower electricity prices uh, of around $4.5 a ton uh, that we're seeing there as well. And realization costs, that includes those treatment charges. But we also had to um, transport our concentrate a little further afield than we had in the previous year, uh, particularly the lead concentrates. And that's added around $700,000 to those costs. And that translates into that um, realization cost down at the bottom, second last line of your uh, of your um, slide there. So still a healthy margin. Um, at just under 40% at Sasa, 39% for a, a lead zinc mine, uh, given where the zinc prices were uh, through the year, we think is a, a really good result. Uh, talking a little bit more about that investment in the business, uh, CapEx for 2023 was $27.8 million, which is just about within guidance. We guided 28 to $30 million for the year. Um, and that um, includes uh, sort of four key items, really. It's uh, sustaining CapEx of each of the assets, um, two of those items. Underground development at SISA, flotation equipment that we've upgraded, and then underground uh, mining equipment. Uh, we've had some fleet replacement there, totaling around $8.7 million. Um, Kuna and sustaining CapEx, uh, you know, is uh, irrigation and dripper pipes, uh, some down payments on anodes, and a, and a few other costs. Still within that $1.2 million that we generally guide at, uh, at um, Kunrad. Uh, and then the Power project, uh, we spent $3 million uh, this year on that to complete that power project, which has been a fantastic result for us. It's already uh, sort of uh, paying us off with, um, uh, you know, producing some, some electricity for the plant, even through the winter, and it will reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by around 10%. 
And last but not least, transition to the paste fill mining. Um, these are the paste backfill plant um, and including underground reticulation. That's uh, that's coming at uh, $3.3 million for the year. Central decline, which is a new access into the mine, which we sort of made operational in May in 2023, $2.8 million. And the dry stack savings plant, which is currently under construction, we spent $7.5 million last year on that. And we're currently guiding uh, $22 to $24 million for next year's, for this year's CapEx. Um, balance sheets. Um, Look, it's a really strong balance sheet. We're really, uh, really fortunate here, being a cash position of fifty-six point eight million dollars on that uh, on that balance sheet. That restricted cash really re relates to <clears throat> some uh, rehabilitation requirements in Kazakhstan. Uh, the only big movements you'll see on that balance sheet are additions to PPE that is related to those capital projects that we mentioned earlier, the solar farm plus the uh, transition projects, and then. Um, also, you will see in other assets, um, there's a, a few interesting items in there. We overpaid uh, income tax by $6.8 million through the year. So that's that's in that line item there. There's some trade and other receivables and our stock levels are um, up at $14 million. So um, that's sort of work in progress, plus also a little bit of stock carried over at Kunrad and, and Sasa. And then also some prepayments on the, uh, on, on the um, equipment for the transition projects of $2.3 million. So, an um, overall excellent looking balance sheet. We're very happy with, uh, with that at the moment. And then moving on to my last slide, which is the cash flow. Um, you can see cash generated from operations, $93.9 million. Um, the uh, investments to our shareholders really in terms of those dividends at $41.5 million and CapEx at $27.8 million. Uh, we are seeing taxes a little bit higher and I've talked through all of those, um, which leads us to that. Um, $57.2 million in cash at the end of uh, December 2023. Uh, free cash flow number $57.5 million. Um, for those of you who don't recall, we calculate that taking our net cash from operations, which this year was $66.4 million. We deduct any additions to uh, PPE, which came in at uh, $10.7 million. We received some interest uh, of $1.9 million. There's a couple of intangible assets that we've invested in as well, particularly the exploration in, in Kazakhstan, that results in that $57.5 million of free cash flow generation for the year. On that note, I'll hand back to Nigel to talk through operations. Thanks very much, Gavin. Um, so just a little bit more detail on the operations, how they performed. If we look at slide 19, this is our standard aerial photograph of the Kunrad mine. Not a lot really to add. I think most people have seen this several times in the eastern dumps and the western dumps there. We are primarily leaching on the western dumps now as we do transition and have been since 2017 transitioning over to those western dumps. We estimate close to 100,000 tonnes recoverable copper still remains in the, in the dumps. Uh, next slide, please, Emma. Uh, just a few statistics. We probably touched on these, so I won't bore the audience anymore with them. As I say, we're operating in the western dumps primarily, uh, but still leaching the eastern dumps. Uh, and we are having more success than the planned 42 to 51 percent as we go back to some of the areas on the eastern dumps and level some of the slopes and actually acquire some more copper from them. Small amounts, but all marginal improvements at very low cost. And you can see if you look back all the way back to 2016, we've been hitting around about 13 to 14,000 tonnes of copper production from, from this waste ore uh, on a quite a disciplined manner. And uh, we've got a life of mine, as I said before, at 20. 34, so another 10 years. Um, next slide, please, Emma. Uh, one of the things, just to emphasize, I think we've, again, already talked about it, but one of the uh, projects that we developed uh, in-house primarily, is a little bit of external assistance, uh, but we built it in-house with our own staff um, and source equipment, obviously, uh, is, is this solar power farm. Um, we completed it on time and below bu budget, cost us $3.1 million. We budgeted more than that. So a great testament to the uh, cost discipline of the guys on site. It is operational now. You can see the bar chart on the right-hand side. It's been operating since November. <laughs> We officially opened it um, and it's going to potentially reduce our scope one and scope two greenhouse gas emissions in country by around about 10 percent and provide around about 16 to 18 percent of the electrical requirements of the plant just moving on please emma into uh, again another year of a uh, lot of activity at the sasa zinc and lead mine and just to remind the audience what that is this is in north macedonia it's a scarn hosted deposit in the in the uh, northeast of Ma north macedonia uh, underground mine, very different to the Kunrad operation. 
And historically, when we acquired it, it was a sub-level caving operation. And we've taken time out to assess that, uh, understand what's going on further down in the ore body as we go lower with geotechnical stresses, and decided to transition to a combination of cut and fill mining and long hole stoping, both of which will use high density paste fill. Uh, and the infrastructure to support that transition uh, will be completed this year. And I'll touch a little bit more on that in a minute. We have reserves and resources and a life of mine out to 2039 at Sasser. Next slide, please, uh, Emma. So just to emphasize, it has been a busy year at SASA. Uh, not only did we reach our or hit our uh, zinc and lead guidance, and you can see on the table to the right, we produced around about 805,000 tonnes of ore, which all fed through to the plant. And you can see the zinc metal produced from that at a recovery of around about 85% and 93% for lead producing 20,000, just in excess of 20,000 tonnes of zinc and close to 28,000 tonnes of lead. Um, as I say, it's also that's alongside developing the projects and the infrastructure required to transition to uh, pace fill mining. And just to remind the audience why we actually went down this path, there's probably four key reasons for it. One of which is the maximum extraction of mineral resources. It's, uh, it's a more accurate mining method. And as we go lower down in the ore body, some of the lenses are becoming narrower and therefore it will allow us to minimize the, uh, the, minimize the dilution and enhance the recovery of metal from the metal that we're actually mining. It has extended the life of the mine out to 2039, the fact that we're able to do this mining uh, methodology. Uh, and also a key requirement early in the, in the decision-making process was the additional tailing storage on, on surface uh, and thereby minimizing the environment, environmental impact. We will in future years be storing our tailings in three ways. One, in the underground voids, also on the dry stack tailings facility and using uh, a lower level of volume going into the, the wet down TSF4, as we call it, uh, which we finished off when we acquired the mine. And it will provide a safer operating environment for the employees underground. Just moving to the next. Next three slides, really, just a bit of a, uh, an update on where we've got to on the three elements of this transition project. And just to remind you, that is the pace backfill plant, dry stack tailings plant, and also the uh, the capital, the central decline, sorry. So on the pace backfill plant, we've now completed the construction. It is fully operational, fully commissioned. Uh, the reticulation system, which is the pipe work effectively to take the paste to the underground mining areas is more or less complete, about 97% installed for phase one. Uh, we have 16 staff to man the plant. They've all been fully recruited internally and going through training as we speak. I think approximately 10 of them are fully trained. The other six will be trained in the next month or so. Uh, and we're ramping up our operations slowly and introducing cement into the system to a 24 hour a day operation. Underground, the pace fill mining, we have uh, crews established and training has begun. The cut and fill stopes have been mined on the 800 level, and I've already mentioned the reticulation. One area where we've had a slight delay is some of the boreholes for introducing paste into those areas, but we expect to complete that during the course of this year and probably into the first half of this year. So good, good advances on the paste backfill plant. Uh, slightly behind on the dry stack tailings plant, but more or less in line with our plans, and we intend to complete this, this uh, part of the project this year. Uh, most of the equipment is on site. Uh, we've done the earthworks and we've laid the concrete. Uh, many of the steelworks have, have been erected for the actual plant and also the warehouse to store the cake. Uh, the separate part of it is the landform where you actually place that cake in a very engineered form. Uh, the vegetation has been cleared for that and we're on track for actually starting cake placement in 2024 and dry commissioning should commence towards the end of H1 2024 for both parts of it, both the plant and also the landform as we call it. And last, but certainly by no means least, the central decline. Um, we hold through from the surface to 910 level in May of this year. Uh, so that really effectively completed phase one. During the course of the year, we constructed um, a decline of about 1,056 meters were developed. Uh, and the reason for the central decline is it will improve the ventilation. You can see some statistics there. And also will improve the productivity by reducing the haulage time of the ore to the surface, because it'll be shorter distances to which to truck that ore. Uh, we've also took the opportunity to put a new pace fill reticulation line into the new central decline, which will be used in the future. Next slide, please, Emma. So that's that's a lot of work that's been going on on site at SASA for the transition project. We've also been quite busy on drilling on site. 
And just to remind everybody, at SASA, there are effectively three ore bodies. The one that we're currently operating in is known as Sfinureka. That's the one off to the left you can see there. And we're going down uh, below the 800 level as we speak and operating in 990 and 910 level. But to the right of it, Kozireka and Galamireka are historically mined areas uh, where we feel there's some uh, potential for additional ore as we go lower. Uh, and so we've done approximately nine and a half thousand metres of drilling uh, this year onto those three ore bodies to try and explore and find more ore for the future. And if you just go to the next slide, Emma, and this is this is my last slide on the operational side, uh, you'll see we have a, a, a bit of success on that and our SASA resources and reserves, if you allow for depletion over the course of the year, of around about 800,000 tonne of mined ore that I mentioned before, we've had a slight increase in our reserves of about 1 million tonne on a net basis, having taken that depletion into account. So that's a result of the exploration work. Um, we're looking for more um, material as we, as we uh, progress this year, and we've got around about 6,600 metres of drilling planned for 2024. <laughs> and just, just one last note before I hand over to Louise, uh, to talk about business development and growth of the business. Since 2017, when we acquired SASA, you can see the statistics at the bottom. Through our drilling uh, and exploration work, we've increased the reserve tonnage. It was 10.9 million tonnes at the time. We've actually depleted it by 5 million tonnes, but we're looking now at 9 million tonnes, which is about 3.1 million tonne overall increase in the SASA tonnage during our ownership. Uh, and on that note, I'll now hand over to Louise to go through sustainability and growth of the business. Thanks very much, Nigel. Yeah, so we're on slide uh, slide 30. So yes, just wanted to um, touch on this slide really. Um, like many uh, like many smaller mining companies, we've been on a really steep learning curve over the last few years with sustainability. While we understood what our stakeholders wanted us to report on externally, and while we sought ways to um, to improve on on key areas on on the effectively the already strong performance that we had on the ground. Um, and we're really pleased uh, this year to note that the strong position that we believe we're now in has been reflected in the ratings um, that we've got, particularly for key ratings um, companies, MSCI and Sustainalytics. Um, and our ratings have improved gradually over the years that we have been putting our sustainability reports out. So um, we're very pleased with our performance there. Um, just on to slide 31, um, just a few uh, key highlights on our sustainability performance in 2023 environmentally we've had a great year um, we've completed the solar power project and um, for the first time we've worked on estimating our scope three emissions and there's much more detail on that in our forthcoming climate change report we also began work on a corporate biodiversity strategy uh, because we know that that's an area that lots of our stakeholders are becoming increasingly <coughs> focused on in terms of health and safety um, we, we also had a good year we had one lti um, clearly one is one too many, but it is an improvement on last year's performance, so 2022's performance, and also we beat our target, um, which was for, for um, LTI frequency rate uh, below 1.41. And finally, in terms of our, um, our charitable donations, uh, we've doubled our commitments to the foundations that we've got during 2023, and we spent the year focusing on long-term sustainability development and also supporting immediate needs in the local communities as well. <coughs> we skip 32 and move to slide uh, 33 to give you an update on our business development activities. Uh, business development remains a top priority for CAMEL right now. Um, as you've heard from Nigel and Gavin, we've got a strong platform from which to grow. Um, we've got two really good quality, long life, low cost operations that generate significant free cash flow from us. We've got a strong balance sheet and we've got no debt. In terms of our strategy, what we're looking to do, that remains the same. We're focusing primarily on base metal opportunities within the European time zone. We're ranging from early stage exploration through development through to um, production opportunities. And we continue to look for those larger transformational uh, um, opportunities to move the business forward. Um, we're really pleased that in the last two sets of financial results that we have um, that we've presented to you, that we've been able to discuss two business development transactions that we've undertaken within the period. So if we look back to uh, our interim results that we presented to you in September, just to give you an update on camel exploration or camel X as we are referring to it, 
Um, that, that subsidiary is now fully set up. Um, we've got uh, now our ownership set up at 80% and our exploration partners have a 20% uh, ownership. And since then, we've been making several applications for licenses in Kazakhstan, two of which um, we've obtained. And there's another six applications uh, which are underway. Moving on to the next slide, 34. Um, and then moving on to a separate announcement that we've made this morning. Um, we're delighted to announce that we've, uh, we've agreed to make a proposed investment into Aberdeen Minerals this morning. Um, this investment is going to be in two stages. It's initially a three million pound investment for 29% interest in the business. Um, and then we also have a warrant to invest an additional £2 million, and that would take us to 38% ownership. We've been really impressed with the Aberdeen team, particularly the CEO who leads the team up in Scotland, based right there um, next to the operational site, the exploration site. So Aberdeen's got um, what we believe is a very promising copper nickel project called Arthrath. We've already seen uh, encouraging geophysics and drilling results from that project. And the team's got a very compelling exploration model, um, which focuses uh, and looks for higher grade, increasing grade nickel and copper sulfides at depth. In, in addition to that, there's also um, a, um, a district, district scale exploration opportunities available to, to the Aberdeen team as well. In terms of the funding that we're going to provide, that will enable the team to drill around 10,000 metres at Arthrath and dependent on results from that, uh, they'll also look at um, update, uh, undertaking a, a mineral resource estimate and also potentially a scoping study as well. So just to wrap up our presentation today, um, we just want to reiterate, we've de delivered a very strong financial performance uh, during a period of lower zinc prices year on year. And looking further out towards the rest of 2024, um, it, this year will be truly transformational year for us. We will have completed all three of the main components of the SASA capital projects, and we will be well on our way to a solely Pegsville mining operation there, with only sustaining capital investment then required for the long term. At Kunrad, we expect to deliver consistency of performance there, and also to increase the renewable power component um, as the full potential of this 3 million investment into the solar power plant comes to fruition in the summer months. And finally, we look forward to hopefully some exciting exploration results at SASA, at Camel X in Kazakhstan, and also from our investment with our new partners at Aberdeen Minerals. And of course, we will continue to look for that major transformational acquisition, which will uh, really set Camel um, for a real positive step into the future. On that note, um, I wanted to hand back to uh, Sergey, and um, and we're ready to take any questions that you have. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, if you wish to ask a question at this time, please signal by pressing star one on your telephone keypad. Please make sure the mute function on your phone is switched off to allow your signal to reach your equipment. If you wish to cancel your request, please press star 2. Again, please press star 1 to ask a question. Now, the first question comes from Marina Calero from RBC Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Good morning. Thanks for the call. I have a couple of questions. Um, the first one is on your investment in Aberdeen Minerals. Assuming the exploration results are successful, when do you think we could see um, the Scopin study being completed? Um, thanks very much, Marina. The investment, the initial three million, and then the two million warrant, um, that would fulfil a budget for Aberdeen for for approximately twenty four months. So, all being well in terms of the exploration, we would expect to see that MRE and the scoping study within the twenty four month period. Okay, that's very clear. And then I have another question on your cost. Um, I know you don't provide cost guidance, but can you give us a bit more color on how you expect your receiving costs at Kunrad and your cost per ton at SASA developing um, during the year? Yeah, I mean, as, as you say, we don't we don't necessarily provide cost guidance on this, but if we um, so we don't expect any any changes at Kunrad really. I think we've given the production guidance there, and you know, it depends what 
you know, I think we've got um, you know, most of those cost inflationary sort of pressures I was talking about earlier now sort of embedded in that, that operation. At SASA, the only areas where we may see a little bit of additional cost now is in the operation of the pace backfill plant and also the draft stack tailings plant. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's two elements that we didn't have in the in the mix before. But again, those are kind of, um, you know, in the sort of single figure dollar per ton range. Yeah. But at a macro yeah. level, Marina, what I would add is that we are seeing inflation in both countries coming down slowly. It's still, I think we've put a headline figure there of about 10% mm -hmm. for both countries, but we're seeing yeah. certainly North Macedonia, it's coming down and electricity has been a big beneficiary yeah. and we hope it continues that way. But uh, likewise, in Kroonrad, we are seeing uh, inflation declining uh, as, as everybody is around the world, to be honest with you. And we expect to hopefully stabilise our costs after what's been quite a difficult couple of years, really. Okay, that's very clear. Thank you. Thank you. And as a reminder, to ask a question, please signal by pressing star one. Our next question comes from Richard Hutch from Berenberg. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, sorry, sorry if I'm, I missed that just off the back of that last question, just on cost inflation. Should we be sort of pushing in like a few percentage points of just real cost inflation, or are you expecting them to stay flat? Sorry if I missed, missed your answer on that one. Um, well, I wouldn't say flat. I think I'd be a bit optimistic if I'm honest with you. Certainly, we're, you know, a few percentage points of inflation because it's still there. Uh, and to Gavin's point, we, we would expect a, a level of, of cost through managing on a full year basis or six months, maybe for this year and the following year, a full year basis, the pace backfill plant, plants and the dry stack tailings plant. Um, it, they are transitional projects. The challenge we have at SASA in that sense is transitioning because there are areas that will become redundant in that operation, mm -hmm. but it takes time to actually take that cost out of the business while you're incurring mm -hmm. the other costs. So we'll, we'll have to manage that tightly. So we'd expect, you know, um, smaller levels of inflation maybe than this year, but it will there will be some cost rises. Okay, helpful. Thanks, Nigel. Um, and then just on um, just on treatment charges um, for the lead and, lead and zinc in, into 24, can you just give us a bit of a, a steer on what you're seeing on that one, please? Yeah, sure, Richard. I think, um, I think the benchmark chat at the moment um, is that zinc is going to come off quite significantly and lead is going to remain more or less flat. So we, we do expect to benefit from that uh, reduction in zinc TCs, and that's as a function of a little more smelter capacity opening up in Europe post the sort of the, the sort of, um, sort of peak of the energy crisis there. Um, and we're also seeing some of the mines that were shut down as a result of that zinc price coming off that I mentioned, um, you know, haven't been restarted. So there's, there's certainly some uh, fundamentals behind that uh, lowering of the zinc TCs. Yeah, okay, cool. And then just on the, the extra 2 million that you can invest in Aberdeen um, through the warrants, um, is is the is the is the kind of just listening to your kind of twenty four month kind of story about the scoping and and such like is that more like a you know the two million exercise of the warrants is you know post drilling twelve months down the line is that the way we should kind of think about it? Yeah, basically, I think I think the three million takes them to around about fifteen months, but yeah, it gives us an opportunity to assess the work to date. Um, and for us to reappraise the investment, but all being well, we would intend to spend the full five million pounds with with Aberdeen. Yeah. Okay. Right. Fine. And then just, I mean, just more broadly on the the business development. I mean, you kind of talk about still looking for that transformational deal. I think you know this one's interesting, but to your point, it's it's you know quite early stage and and, and perhaps higher risk than a, a you know higher risk but you know lower ticket size than um you know a, a more significant transaction where, where are we in 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 the the more significant transaction sort of journey there's quite a few yeah. equity stories have, have been derated de right there's some quite cheap well quote unquote cheap um projects out there that that could fit your your target ranges you know is 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 the price still the the, the factor or the the issue factor or you know where are we on that that journey of 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 that yeah. that third asset case sure. yeah. no absolutely and actually you know where we are on that slide 33 where i sort of talked about our overall strategy and um, we put our usual stats on there in terms of um the opportunities that we'd appraise the ndas we signed but I think really what I would point you to is the differences year on year is the number of site visits that we've undertaken and, and the amount of money that we've spent are using external consultants, which Gavin also referenced in his, his finance section. So we made seven site visits um, in 2023 versus two in 2022. 
and we also used external consultants so that's technical consultants legal those sorts of aspects for four opportunities last year um, and we've started i think i can say we've started 2024 with a strong pipeline of opportunities as well so um obviously we can't we can't be confident that any of these come off but but a lot of these would be this these larger transformational type opportunities um we are we are genuinely very excited about the future with Aberdeen but totally acknowledge that we're still looking for that larger transformational um opportunity and that and that remains our core focus okay understood thanks team thanks Richard team hub can I court please go ahead uh yeah thank you very much um just um Following up on on Hatchie's last question there on, on growth, your your slide number eight in the presentation goes through strategic objectives. Second of which is a prudent uh, capital allocation strategy, and sensibly you mentioned dividends in there. Yep. Um, I was a little bit surprised to see delivering growth at the bottom of the list there as a longer term strategic objective, and even on that slide seventeen where you. You know, you take the um, the operating cash flow and then um, go through where that's been invested over the past year. The first thing that comes off of there is the dividend. So, I guess the question is, what what are your capital allocation priorities? I mean, usually it's a net OCF, and you usually see um, sustainable capex coming out of there, and then internal external growth opportunities, and then excess cash returns last. So I was wondering if you could go through or just remind us what your capital allocation priorities are. Um, it's, a good, it's a good question and please don't be uh, misled by the optics of one particular slide. I think actually internally we did discuss maybe that goes at the top. I think certainly in our minds as to the hardest thing to deliver is that particular bullet point, the delivering growth through the more transformational opportunity. I think what you've seen this morning is that, you know, whilst we still look for that transformational opportunity, we are you know, and we want to deploy capital into that, that the growth projects. We are prepared to both invest it in our own operations, in earlier stage operations, and importantly, back to shareholders where we haven't got the money to spend on necessarily at the moment. The transformational opportunity will be something that requires uh, raising of equity, we suspect, and also debt, a combination of both, really, uh, depending on what the opportunity is. So I think the message we're giving out today is that we have, still have strong cash flow and we wish to deploy capital to, you know, and allocate it properly. And it's always a balance, isn't it, between internal, uh, external growth as well as giving back to shareholders. And hopefully we're getting that balance right whilst we're still very active looking for the growth opportunity, which is is obviously harder than uh, than investing in earlier stage exploration opportunities where we're just using our own balance sheet to invest in. So the focus is very much as Louise tried to emphasize that we are active in the market uh, and we want to find the right opportunity to enhance shareholder value. That's very true. Uh, can I just have one follow up question on that then? By all means. Um, I, I guess I was just wondering how, how you view the cash versus dividend, the cash levels versus dividend balance, because, I mean, obviously, if you're looking for that longer term growth opportunity and you mentioned raising equity, you probably want to build your cash balances were that to happen. So you issue less equity. But I guess what's the maximum level of cash you really want to hold on the balance sheet? And do you use the dividend? as the outflow to maintain that cash balance, i.e. if you have a really good year or a good couple of years like we have forecast, does that dividend actually go up instead of coming back? <laughs> uh, it's a good question, actually. Um, I, I think in terms of, I'd like Gavin answer as well, actually, because in terms of what's the maximum cash on the limit, certainly from a minimum cash, we tend to, tend to look at how much do we burn each month, look at the number of months we feel so we'd probably say a minimum cash level will be around about for the current operations maybe 30 million that kind of level maximum cash i mean it's a nice problem to have isn't it we hope that in the future even paying back strong dividend returns will still grow the treasury side of it whilst we're looking for this major growth opportunity yeah. i think there's no there's no metric tim on a minimum cash level and then pay everything out yeah i think that, that that's key and i think you know when we when we discussed the the dividend that was announced today that was discussed in the context of what are the other needs of the cash and what is the cash generation of the business going to be over the next 12 to 24 months 
And we were confident enough that there'd be more than enough cash to finance things like Aberdeen, finance, you know, exploration in Kazakhstan, finance the continued capital expenditure at, um, at Sasa and at Kunrad, plus also end the year with a, a very healthy cash balance. And as Nigel said, that becomes a, a slightly different sort of issue to, to discuss and contend with. But I think it's a, it's a, First world problem, I think, in the vernacular yeah. today. Yeah. I, I think there's a recognition, Tim, that we don't know where this you know, transformational opportunity will come from, how much it costs, what size it will be. We hope it will be of the size of a SASA or more than that, to be honest with you. But looking forward in the current operations, we are coming to the end of a capital programme and we see light at the end of the tunnel on that and ongoing sustaining capital, capital which is more than manageable within the cash flow generation of the business and, and very confident in the metals that we, we produce. I mean, the world's gone through very inflationary environment and I suspect the whole world's cost base has gone up by 15 to 20 percent and that can only be good for the metal prices into the future and if we can contain our costs then we'll be generating uh, even better cash flows for the future and so I think it's a a sign of confidence and, and trying to get the balance right on how we allocate capital for today with a, a mind with an eye to the future as well. Okay that's really helpful thank you. And we will now take our next question from Oliver O'Donnell from ECA Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, just two things. Uh, SASA, uh, I think there's been a medium term target of about 830,000 8, tonnes a year for throughput. Um, now you've done a bit more drilling further progress in the, in, in the decline. Were you able to give any more colour on? what the um, route to achieving that looks like and whether that's still the case. Yeah. Um, and then on Aberdeen Minerals, um, will you be able to do any met work as part of the drilling? Will, would that be included in the scoping study or is it very much likely to be a sort of desktop study? Thanks. Uh, well, I'll answer the first bit. I'll probably answer the second bit, but I'll let Louise answer that. She's closer to Aberdeen than I am. But on the first bit, the 8.30 still remains the target, Oliver, in terms of output at SASA. Um, this year, obviously, we're still completing the transition, still got work on the infrastructure and the, and the dry stack tailings plant. As I mentioned, still completing off the central decline. But over the next couple of years, what you'll see is that instead of only 30% coming up through the declines and 70% through the Glamour Wrecker shaft. That will transition over to ultimately 100% coming up through that new central decline. We're developing the faces uh, as we go lower in the ore body. We have the flotation plant with probably a restraint of about 850,000 tonnes per annum. So all those factors taken into consideration, our realistic uh, aim at the moment is to get up to 830,000 tonnes. And I think you'll see us do that uh, in the next couple of years as we ramp up production and we finish off the transition and move completely to, uh, well, sorry, that's not strictly true. We will still be doing some level caving for a couple of years but there will be a higher level of uh, you know pace fill mining being done in the lower levels of the mine body the ore body yeah in terms of um, of Aberdeen and the uh, question on the metallurgy um yes the the simple answer is yes there will be in fact um Aberdeen was able to get um a grant funding um a, a portion of grant funding from the British government from a group called the Automotive Transformational Fund and that's specifically to look into uh, quite innovative metallurgical test work for the uh, for the nickel and the copper and the copper and the cobalt ores there particularly looking at um, hydrometallurgical type solutions for those as well so that works underway and yes that would form part of any um, financial studies uh, to be done in the future. Great thanks very much. Thanks, Oliver. Thank you. And as there are no further questions at this time, I'd like to hand the call back over to Nigel Robinson, Chief Executive Officer, for any additional or closing remarks. Over to you, sir. Um, well, thank you very much. And thanks to everybody for attending and also uh, the, the, the questions. And I suppose just in summary, really just emphasize what Louise mentioned, that, you know, our outlook for this year is to finish off on the transition projects at SASA, uh, to strengthen our two operations there. And we've develop them for the future uh, but a continued focus is on growing the business and looking for that transformational opportunity we have a really solid base to build from uh, but the challenge really is to find that operation that transformational sorry uh, opportunity in the course of this year uh, we've got guidance similar to the previous years uh, we expect to deliver on that guidance maintaining the costs 
uh, and we'll be looking at the metal prices uh, into the future, which in the early part of this year have improved both for zinc and copper as the uh, some various supply constraints uh, and demand starts coming through for those metals. So we look forward to uh, an, an exciting 2024 uh, and thank our shareholders and supporters for uh, investing in the business in the past.